on episode 7 of Omnivore, digging in to regenerative agriculture, baking with quinoa, and silver linings in the processed foods debate. All that coming up, this is Omnivore, from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT First, annual event and expo. Join science of food professionals from around the globe, July 16th through the 19th in Chicago. Go to iftevent.org to learn more. Welcome to another episode of Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm your host, Bill McDowell. In food production, the massive undertaking to cut greenhouse gas emissions quite literally starts from the ground up. Regenerative agriculture practices, including planting cover crops and reducing tillage, are vital to ensuring soil health and carbon sequestration. Food Technologies' Kelly Hensel spoke with Dr. Elizabeth Reiki, a soil microbiome scientist at the Soil Health Institute, about the implementation of soil health practices, new emerging technologies, and what needs to be done to ensure the agriculture sector reaches its net zero goal. So in the article, you stated that soil health is the foundation for regenerative agriculture. And I was hoping you could talk to me a little bit more about this. Do regenerative agriculture practices, by their very definition, improve soil health? Sure. I mean, I think region ag practices all have the potential to improve soil health, but it really depends on successful implementation and realistic expectations. So one good example is cover crops. So cover crops provide, uh, their roots provide organic residues that help build soil organic carbon, and their above ground biomass also works to prevent erosion. But now think about a cover crop that's growing in say, Northern Minnesota versus one in a more temperate climate, say Missouri. Chances are that cover crop that's growing in the temperate climate, it's gonna have a longer period of time to grow before going dormant in the winter and therefore make a bigger impact on soil health. At SHI, we work to quantify some of these changes using a small suite of measurements so folks can really monitor their progress following implementation of some of these different practices. So in addition to, you know, you mentioned some of the practices already, but in addition to practices such as the cover crops and mm-hmm. reducing tillage, are there, um, you know, there are obviously some exciting new technologies that are helping scientists and farmers to understand and improve the conditions of the soil. So I was wondering what technologies you believe hold the most promise in making significant improvements. Yeah, well, being a soil microbiologist, I might be a little biased in my answer, but I'm really excited about the integration of some of these different DNA technologies. So for the past, I don't know, few decades, I would say, different soil biological measurements have kind of been limited to some of these broad scale measures of microbial activity or microbial biomass. But now we're really able to kind of dig into some of the different functions that these different microbes are providing. Everything from breaking down organic residues to cycling important nutrients like nitrogen in the soil all dependent on these different microbes. So what we're doing, right, working on right now is linking some of these functional genes to beneficial ecosystem services. And this is really kind of the holy grail. You know, we're able to quantify all these different things, but being able to translate them to beneficial services to the farmers and other stakeholders is really important. So yeah, I think it's an exciting time, a lot of data to dig through, but good things to come. Yeah, that is exciting to see all that data turn into action, hopefully for, you know, beneficial results in the near future. So that's awesome. So, you know, obviously there's this whole net zero movement. (laughs) And I was wondering if, in your opinion, the agriculture, especially the U.S. agricultural sector, is on track to achieve net zero C emissions by 2040. And, you know, what needs to be done or changed to accelerate those efforts? Sure. I mean, I think, first of all, it is a lofty goal, but I think we are on the right track for moving forward. I also think it's important not to forget all the good things that come with storing additional carbon in the ground, like building soil aggregates that can increase drought resilience or microbes that enhance mineralization and provide plant available nutrients. As far as what we what we need to be, be doing and enhance, I think we need to give farmers the tools they need to be successful. So this is everything from 
making sure cover crop seeds are available to them at the right times, to building peer-to-peer -peer networks to share knowledge gain, knowledge gains, um, and then even you know ways to measure and interpret the impacts of the new practices that they're implementing to give them an idea of where they are and where they can go. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds uh, vital, especially I, I think in the article, I'm not sure who it was that had talked about it, but measurement. Yeah, it's really important. And yeah, it, SHI, we had a big project a few years ago where we looked at a lot of different soil health measurements that were out there in public and private sectors and came up with kind of a, a small suite of measurements that we really think can be used at scale. That actually brings to mind another question I had for you. Is the Soil Health Institute focused on doing work um, mainly in North America, or are you guys more of a global organization? So right now we have active projects in the U.S. and Canada, but we have been uh, working with folks both in Europe and South America to try and get some more things going. So, yeah, right now that's our goal, you know, improve soil health everywhere. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you again for speaking with me today, Dr. Riki. Obviously, soil health is a very important subject, and I'm glad to be able to pick your brain about it for a little bit. So thank you. Elizabeth Riki is a soil microbiome scientist at the Soil Health Institute. You can learn more about soil health and how regenerative agriculture can impact the road to net zero food production in the March issue of Food Technology. Researchers from the Virginia Tech Department of Food Science and Technology and the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences have kicked off a study on the flavor and shelf life of field-grown and indoor-grown cherry tomatoes. Through this study, researchers will analyze samples from both local conventional growers and indoor agricultural growers in Virginia to compare their shelf lives and flavors. Food Technologies Associate Editor Emily Little discusses the scope of the Virginia Tech research and why cherry tomatoes were an ideal subject. I'm Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology Magazine, here with today's news story. I recently learned about some new research coming out of Virginia Tech University's Department of Food Science and Technology. With this study, they're going to look at the flavor and shelf life of both field-grown and indoor-grown cherry tomatoes. Now, why did they pick cherry tomatoes, you might ask? Well, not only are cherry tomatoes growing in popularity with consumers just because of their health benefits and the ease of consumption, you know, you can just pop one in as a little snack or add them to your salad, your pasta, all kinds of applications. But tomatoes also make up a multi-million dollar market in the state of Virginia and therefore boost the state economy. So this was a great conduit for the researchers to do this type of work. I had the chance to talk with Virginia Tech Assistant Professor of Food Science Union about this research, and she told me some interesting things. She said, based on their preliminary research, indoor-grown tomatoes are likely to be less flavorful, but they have a longer shelf life. And vice versa, tomatoes grown in the field are going to be more flavorful, but not necessarily going to last as long. So she discussed how do we market this to consumers? How do we tell the consumer what they're buying and make sure that they know the differences so they can pick something based on what they need? If they need something that's going to last a bit longer in their refrigerator, they probably want to get the indoor grown. But if they want something they can eat today, outdoor will do the trick. Through this study, the researchers will analyze samples from both local conventional growers and indoor agricultural growers with hydroponic systems in Virginia. They wanted to keep this as local as possible. Union had a lot of emphasis on the localness of this study. The analysis will include liquid chromatography and grass chromatography mass spectrometry coupled with olfactory detection. Not only are cherry tomatoes delicious, but Yin also explained to me some of the health impacts that cherry tomatoes can have. They have boosting vitamins, phytochemicals, and plenty of minerals in them. And she said that they can fulfill either the fruit or vegetable section of most dietary guidances. 
How many other foods do you know that can do two jobs at once? So looking forward, they're hoping that this research will give a holistic view of the differences between these two types of tomatoes, whether you grow them indoors or outdoors, and come up with a way to market that to consumers so that they are just as involved with that purchase as they can be, that they have all of the information that they can make for their own personal choice. That's all for me for this week, and I'll talk to you soon. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. At IFT First annual event and expo this July, attendees will experience innovation in action, research, scientific discoveries, and connect with peers new and old. The theme of this year's IFT First is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Attendee registration is now open. Register today at ifteventorg Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Quinoa is a nutritious and increasingly popular ancient grain. But can it be used to make tasty cookies? Washington State University graduate student Elizabeth Nalbandian teamed with associate professor Dr. Girish Ganjal to explore quinoa's applications in baked goods. Nalbandian, an experienced baker with passion for both food science and culinary arts, recapped the goals and findings of the Washington State research in a recent interview with Food Technologies' Mary Ellen Kuhn. Welcome to the Omnivore Podcast, Elizabeth. Let's start by having you tell our listeners a little about yourself and how you became involved in the Quinoa Research Project in Dr. Girish Ganjal's Food Science Lab at Washington State. Thanks for having me. So I started working um, in the lab during my undergrad degree, and I really wanted to get some hands-on experience and learn more about food processing. I was really curious, and it seemed like a really good place to start. So I worked there for for a couple months, and then I was also um, an honors student, and I needed to have an honors thesis research project. So I talked to Dr. Gonjol, and he and his postdoc helped me come up with it with an idea. And they said, well, you have lots of culinary experience from your undergrad degree. Why don't we combine that together with um, our food processing and do a project that's related to product development in quinoa? And that really got me started on research and inspired me um, to, to go to grad school. I understand that part of the project involved evaluating 10 different breeding lines of quinoa for their performance in cookie baking and as cooked grains. Let's talk about the cookies. What did you learn about the different strains of quinoa from the cookie baking experiments, and why is that important? So the 10 different grains that we looked at have very different characteristics. And so we wanted to see what among all these characteristics could be influential on um, cookies to see if if we could tell if it would be good in in a cookie or a baked product. So we found that um, a processing characteristic called water holding capacity was very influential. The flour retained more water and then it caused for a smaller diameter and was not as good for cookies. And we also found that the protein content was very influential um, for some of the quality attributes that we were looking at for cookies. So what was the optimal protein content? So I would say um, for cookies, you don't want um, too high of a protein content just because it creates more of a, the cookie doesn't spread as well. So you could make cookies about 12%, I think was the highest um, that worked out in our cookies. Those were the tastiest. Yes. And you were working with quinoa that was bred specifically to grow well in the climate conditions of the Pacific Northwest, right? And is that a Washington State University project too? Yes, that is correct. So we collaborate a lot with Dr. Kevin Murphy um, and he has been working on these varieties for about 10 years. And he kind of narrowed down some of his plant breeding operations in quinoa for 10 lines and wanted us to help him give more information regarding their processing characteristics to help him be able to release some of these varieties for farmers to use and sell. So we did um, a lot of research. We did cookies, cooked grains, and we also did some sensory evaluation and um, 
they ju- they were in the stage of increasing the seed that and um, they're getting ready to commercialize two varieties. So that is very exciting. Well, that does sound exciting. Um, what does that mean, increasing the seed? Usually they grow experimental plots, so they're very small. So once they have um, a variety that they're interested in, they need more seed to do more experiments with. So they sent it down to a winter nursery in Chile and got more seed um, to be able to plant here in the Pacific Northwest. So do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, varying amounts of quinoa flour to the cookie recipes and how did that go and what did you discover? So in our first study, we kind of did, um, we did a lot of substitution ratios, 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent. And we saw that once you really got close to the 100%, um, it really did influence the cookie quality. So the cookies weren't as nice and big compared to the control. Um, But we did find that about um, between 10 to 30%, I would say was kind of the golden standard was um, you could see that the cookie does have quinoa. It influences um, some of the quality characteristics, but it could still be used comparably to the control cookie. Uh, We also did a sensory evaluation and we're not quite done with all those results, but we did find that some people even preferred the quinoa cookies over the control and certain substitution ratios. So that was very interesting to find. And I think that was more related to some of the nuttiness that the quinoa adds. It just adds another flavor depth to the cookie and consumers really enjoy those flavors. So at the same time, that's also helping with the nutritional profile, right? Exactly, yes, because quinoa is both um, high in protein, high in fiber. So, yes, it would increase uh, the nutritional quality of cookies. So do you and Dr. Ganjal think there's a real market opportunity for cookies made with quinoa flour? Yes, um, we definitely think there is. Um, as as we previously mentioned, um, the grain is extremely nutritious, both in protein and fiber, and it's also gluten free, so that's where I see a big a big place in the market for quinoa. A lot of the gluten free items are made with a lot of starches and different gums, and those aren't very nutritious. So being able to use some of the quinoa flour that's high in some of the nutritional quantities that we looked at are um, would would be a very good fit for the baking industry. That makes sense, and and that does seem like an area where there would be a. a- important market opportunity. Well, what's next on the quinoa research agenda? Well, there's there's a couple of things we've been looking into. Uh, first thing, we've been trying um, to do some more product development work with quinoa. Um, I've been recently working on a chocolate cake that actually has 100% quinoa in it, and that actually tastes really good. Um, another thing we've been looking at is um, doing some quinoa fractionation, so isolating protein, fiber, and starch, and looking at some of those quality attributes, and then also looking uh, at the saponins uh, in quinoa. Well, just a little bit about you. Um, you're pursuing a PhD in food science, but you have a culinary background and undergraduate degrees in both food science and hospitality and business management. Was that background in both areas really helpful on this project? Yes, definitely so. So um, I would say the culinary background really helped me develop some of these formulations and work with the food much easier since I knew how to operate in a kitchen, very familiar with baking cookies and different products. So that was where um, some, some of those skills came in handy. And the food science is basically all the science that's involved. So I could make very nice cookies, but it's also important to know why, um, for example, why the cookies were a little smaller when we added lots of um, lots of quinoa into them. So the food science background has been really been, been able to help me to um, understand the reasonings behind some of my results. And that's something that I was always interested when I, from when I was a little girl, I would always be baking in the kitchen and I always wondered oh why does this happen why why do, why do certain things like why does a sauce get thickened when we add some cornstarch in it so that's really where uh, the food science knowledge has been coming in handy for this project and I really do enjoy uh, working in this field well it sounds like a great marriage of disciplines and skill sets thank you very much 
Elizabeth Nalbandian is a doctoral student at Washington State University researching applications for quinoa and baked goods. For more insights into what this research has shown, read the Science Forward column in the March issue of Food Technology and the November 2022 issue of the Journal of Food Science. It's been nearly 14 years since Carlos Montanero and his colleagues at the University of Sao Paulo debuted the NOVA classification system, which ignited a contentious debate within the food and nutritional science communities around the definition and health impact of so-called ultra-processed foods. There are signs that the public is just now beginning to pay attention. Rabobank analyst Nicholas Faraday sees this as a wake-up call for food companies that produce many of the foods that are being labeled ultra-processed. I recently spoke with Faraday about the opportunities and challenges he sees for food companies to reframe the discussion. Nicholas, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. So your recent essay uh, in food technology might strike some food manufacturers as a little counterintuitive. Um, You see this ongoing debate around processed foods having some hidden opportunities. Explain what you mean by that. I often find um, when we talk about these subjects, they're often presented in a very negative way. And, and, you know, we get preached at and lectured. And, and I felt that if I talk about opportunities and try and look at it in a positive manner, then I thought it may be more engaging because so much around ultra-processed foods and, and whether they are in fact, do in fact lead to poor health outcomes is still to be undecided, right? And, and so we shouldn't be um, labeling them too negatively until we know more. So far in this debate, the defense of most food processors has basically been to say, look, everything that we eat is processed in some form or another. But you say in the long run, that probably is not going to be a winning argument. Why? Initially, when I start talking to people, they they are a little dismissive of the thing. Um, uh, You know, this makes no sense, or we, we already know about this, but we just use different language. But I did keep getting the everything is processed argument. Let's talk about something else. And that set alarm bells uh, ringing for me because, first of all, it showed a lack of curiosity around the subject, which is always um, not not a good sign. And also, you know, you and I, we've been in the food industry as observers or, or whatever for quite some time. And I, I can't really ever describe a, a situation or a debate where the food industry has been on the winning side of an argument, right? Um, certainly when you look at GMO and, and the anti-GMO movement or, or the fact that we all became gluten-free, even if we had no um, problems with, with, with wheat, that, that this sudden belief that we, people would trust us if we just told them it was nothing to worry about because everything is processed, I thought was um, not how history would teach us um, and, and, and quite naive. So we're at a point where, you know, there's been lots of studies and lots of correlations. And there's only been one, uh, possibly in a couple of studies, trying to really dig, dig into, into this. And, and the conclusion of that is, is, is that we need more research, right? And so the whole industry, whether you're pro or against from wherever you're starting from uh, processed foods, needs to understand more about, about what's going on. And so because we don't have that real clear uh, understanding in, in a lot of ways, um, then, then we do need to kind of dig a little deeper and, and find out what's going on. But also, uh, you know, to raise the concern or the awareness that other parts of the world have made up their mind to a certain extent. They are writing and using the language of ultra-processed foods within their recommendations for, for the public, for, for a mainstream audience to avoid. So they're not, in some ways, they're not waiting for further research. They feel what's out there already from the academics and so on is sufficiently robust and persuasive to advise consumers to avoid or to limit consumption of. And that's another alarm bell, I feel. So let's break down some of these areas where you see opportunity to uh, reframe the conversation. So one of one of the uh, talking points that, that, that you raise is uh, for those who are producing the raw ingredients, those in agriculture or farming. 
So if we were looking towards companies that were producing single ingredient, minimally processed foods, then this is an extra marketing opportunity for them. And because ultra processed foods is very agnostic uh, in today's trends, it covers large companies, small companies, better for you companies, and so on then it did present a very, very interesting marketing opportunity for, say, a dairy company producing a single ingredient milk, uh, trying to uh, you know, make its voice heard when it's been crowded out by alternate, alternative dairy products which have uh, multiple ingredients, which is often a sign of, of processing. And you say that companies who have ongoing initiatives toward things like clean label or, or or fewer ingredients that there's there's a, a story that they can tell yeah it, it's to some ways that i feel the consumer is kind of primed to understand some of these concepts and and to kind of, and to get behind it because and it was one of the reasons why i, I would argue that a lot of plant-based meat companies have not done well is that we've kind of learned the the mantra of, of fewer ingredients the better you know this concept of clean labels that has been around for quite a while and has been adopted by even the largest of, of the food companies. And so uh, it's, it's not necessarily a problematic ingredient, but the fact that multiple ingredients is kind of a symptomatic of a, or a, a sign of, of, of a project being ultra processed. So companies can already talk to the fact that they are trying to, um, in their language, clean up the food label. So the next item that's on your list is to do more to tout other advances in food tech? So I'm really just trying to spell out some of the routes that companies could look for, um, rather than say simplifying a, uh, an ingredients list, is there some technological solution uh, that could be um, could be help in here? For example, there is a company, a, a young company called something like True Essence Foods, and they have developed technologies which help preserve the flavor and respect the flavor of, of food ingredients. So as you know, as you modify, as you process a, a particular food ingredient, whether it's cocoa that goes in, into chocolate, some of the flavor is lost during the, 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 the process. Um, and, and so they are finding ways to enhance or attain the, the integrity of the flavor. One of the points that I thought was interesting is that you said that companies could use this debate as an opportunity to do a little bit of reverse engineering and, and take a look at some of the, what are the underlying drivers of processed foods in the first place? Yeah, that that's probably a deeper conversation around, you know, how did we end up where we are today? Uh, you know, what were the driving forces that kind of led us to a world where we're having highly processed foods that now account for, you know, 70% of the supermarket and 50% of, of a typical American's calories. And, and some of those drivers are the market competition, the push to getting, you know, cheaper uh, costs of good, cheaper ingredients and, and cutting corners in some ways. And so where we've ended up today may not have been where anyone planned us to be, but because of a variety of forces, some of those markets, some of those regulatory, some of those consumer demands, we've ended up where we are. And so I, I would argue and you know, love to hear from some of your audience about you know, the, the, the industrially produced bread we have today may be using many more processes and techniques than it did 10 or even 15 years ago. And one wonders to what extent we've lost something um, because of that. And so it does sound a bit caveman-ish to talk about reverse engineering and going back to a, a simpler form, but many of the foods that are now being classified in this kind of Nova classification of being ultra processed were actually minimally processed previously, or if you make them at home, they're minimally processed. And so to what extent can an industrial food process simplify itself and get back, uh, for want of a better word, basics? And you you just mentioned Nova, but one of your final points was the fact that Nova is only one of a number of these nutrient profiling systems. And yeah. that, uh, you know that that simply the fact that this debate is on the table might actually be something that's a catalyst to additional r and d for sure, sure. So again, to to repeat, where we are now is that you know because of this um, nova classification, which has gained popularity amongst academics, we and we are now viewing packaged food 
um, through the lens of processing in a way that we didn't before. We were kind of focusing on particular ingredients or whatever. And so much still needs to be understood about what exactly is going on. But when you start to look at foods, then you shouldn't just, um, to what extent should you just view them by their degree of processing or should you view them by their calorie count? Should you view them about their ethical practices around labor and, and, and your child labor or whatever and so on and so on. So it could ultimately just be another new metric and the additional layer of complexity that goes into this algorithm to advise us on what is the best choice of, of foods for us. So Nicholas, you represent one of the, if not the most influential investment banks in the whole food and ag space. What's your bottom line here? Ultimately, do you think any of the, that this is going to have a meaningful impact on either consumer behavior or in the way that food companies go about creating new products? Or is this is this just background noise? So, so hand on heart, um, I don't know, right? And I think what the objective of the report was uh, and the note, um, or the essay, is, as you called it, is to really raise awareness uh, to, to the industry um, that this may be coming down the line. And it, we, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, but if you don't have a planning scenario around this, and if you don't have a, a robust defense of your practices, other than it's all processed, um, then, then I think you could end up on the back foot of this debate. And, and again, to repeat my earlier point, because the food industry has often been on the back foot uh, and, and on the defense of, of debates um, and lost out, right, lost out. Um, even if the science is on their side, then then this it could become very serious. Nicholas Faraday is executive director of Food and Consumer Trends for the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Division of Rabobank. You can read his dialogue essay in the March issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT First Annual Event and Expo. This year's event theme is Innovation in a Time of Crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Go to iftevent.org today. Join us and be part of the solution. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore. Omnivore.